start recording. Good evening, everyone. This is MED 210, Anatomy and Physiology 2, February 10, week six. What is due tonight? Your task five, discussion five, and uh, lesson five. And uh, what are we doing this week? Is, we'll bring it up. Let me also add two other people just came in. Okay, I added them in. Six plus one, that's me, that's seven. All right, wonderful. So what are we doing this evening? Is a skeletal system. Now we got to look at bones as not like like a table or a chair. Um, uh, it's an actual living, breathing thing, and they're hollow, and they have things inside of them, and they're uh, and it's actually a system, and they communicate with each other, and they they have uh, immune systems. It has blood, and it does other things other than um, support and uh, you know. Um, um, and keep your body afloat. Um, so let us, what, uh, we'll also be going over any uh, space in between two bones is a joint. And um, this is a nice video, but uh, it all comes down to knowing the three types of uh, joint systems. And um, it's uh, the three types of joint systems are defined on how well or how not well, uh, they move or don't move. Okay, let me add Miss Reed. All righty. So let's go now look at, uh, I believe it's chapter nine or chapter eight in your textbook. Open stacks. And do, 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 do. okay, we'll go to table of contents, chapter eight or nine. There you are. So let's go to bones. So it's kind of like they they broke it up into chapter six, seven, and eight, and then nine will be the um, um, uh, the joints. So. Let's look at uh, let's look at uh, the actual functions of bone or osseous tissue. It not only supports the body; it also facilitates movement. Any and it goes any of you who've ever broken a bone knows that uh, it's not very good to move your body when even if you've uh, broken your uh, the tips of your fingers. So it also facilitates movement because. The skeletal muscles are connected to, of course, your skeleton, which is your bones. Also, also the protections of internal organs we mentioned before, really, really hard to get at the lungs and the heart um, in the thoracic cage because of all the bones that are uh, protecting it. And it makes sense. The cardiovascular system and your respiratory system is very, very important. So whoever built you, um, built you with, uh, hey, uh, the more important things have to be protected. That's why we have a skull, uh, also known as your calvarium, which is, um, you know, covering, of course, your brain. We have a spinal cord, vertebrae. The spinal cord is protected by your vertebrae. And we're going to talk about uh, those as well. Another thing that, uh, that bone does is it stores and re releases minerals and, of course, fat. So if you break a bone, guess what leaks into the bloodstream and leaks into the third space uh, bones, uh, all the minerals, all the fat deposits, and of course blood, because I just mentioned that um, there are, um, um, uh, what do you call that, blood vessels associated with your bones. So let's jump right in. When you, one of the things that they love to do about bones is classifications and a and here is a typical 
classification question. So um, one type of bone is long. So bones like your femur, which is your thigh bone, that is considered an example of a long bone because it's of course long, like a stick. Then you have uh, uh, short bones, okay? Um, which are, uh, sometimes they even call them um, like cuboidal, right? Because they're cube-like. So if we look at here, the bones of your ankles and of course the bones of your wrist, your carpals in your wrist and your tarsals in your ankle, those are considered short bones. Then you have flat bones, like your uh, manubrium sterni, which is your sternum, right? Right here. And also your skull is considered a flat bone. And you could think about it as, um, you know, what happens if you fold it over a pancake? It'll, it'll, it'll make a dome. And uh, it's, um, it's considered your, your calvarium or your, your skull is considered a flat bone. Now, a regular bone, like your vertebrae, that's a regular, that's weird looking. Your hips here, those are weird looking. And they don't make much sense. So these are regular bones. And the last one is called your sesamoid. Oid is the suffix meaning resembling resembling a sesame seed. So that is your patella or your kneecap. So right off the bat, I could give you a classification question. I could give you an identification question. If I pointed at this, that's a femur. I could ask you, femur, what kind of bone is it? You'll tell me long. I could point at this and you'll tell me that's your manubrium sterni or your sternum and it is a flat bone. I could point at this, your skull or your calvarium and that is also a flat bone. I could point at any one of your vertebrae, right? And you could see here, nice little hole here uh, for your uh, spinal cord and see nice and protected. And you also have these processes here. This is how I know this is a thoracic because you have these little processes here that connect into your ribs and that's considered an irregular bone. Any of your wrist or your uh, ankle bones, wrist, that it would be carpal, you know, just like in carpal tunnel, and tarsal with a T, that will be your ankle bones. And these, those are short bones. Okay, oh, here, look at this, a nice, uh, a nice little thing. But classification, examples, really nice, really straightforward. So let's look at what does a long bone or bone typically look like. So if you have a long bone, um, if you look on the ends, there's articular cartilage. Bones shouldn't be rubbing together. And that's why whoever built this built this pretty perfect. And they put cartilage here. Now cartilage is just like bone, but it's, it's just as tough as bone, but it's flexible and not as hard. So uh, we have articular cartilage, cartilage here to help articulate our bones, to help move our bones and also to reduce friction on those ends. But when you get older, uh, this stuff starts to wear away, especially if you've done stuff like, you know, uh, a, a lot of strenuous activity, or you're like me, you like breaking bones and like doing stupid things when you were young. This stuff starts to wear away. And then um, remember there's joint spaces here. Then you could have inflammation and infection of those joint spaces. Hence the term arthritis or known as the arthritides. You have spongy bone. You see how it's like a sponge. There's a lot of little spaces. And then you have compact bone, okay? And the spongy bone, that will hold the minerals. Um, and you can see here, there's red here. And sometimes there's little yellow in here as well. That's red marrow is for red blood cells and hematopoietic function, meaning hematopoiesis, the uh, production of uh, red blood cells. And on, of course, Bones have a decent amount of fat in it. Is if any of you ever had um, um, oxtail soup, or uh, any Filipinos in the house, bulalo, or uh, any Spanish people here, sopa de res, that all has really salty goodness in here and also fatty goodness. Now this makes sense because what blood's got a lot of salt in it and fat. Fat's awesome. 
fat is the reason why things taste good in the restaurant. So you have spongy bone, compact bone. You could have red marrow and yellow marrow. The red marrow is for hematopoiesis. The yellow marrow, of course, is fat, and fat is storage of glucose. Okay? So uh, we also have coverings, which makes sense because bone is pretty important and it's pretty strong. So you have the periosteum. You see here, there's a hard outside layer. And then you have a, a little bit softer, but it's still good. It's still pretty strong. Your endosteum. So the endosteum is the layers of the bone on the inside. The periosteum is the layers on the outside. And you could see there are little holes called foramen that um, arteries, veins, and nerves go in and out because this bone is a living thing. It can live, it can die. And if it lives, it dies. It needs nutrients, it has an immune system, and it needs to get rid of its waste. Okay? Here's some yellow bone marrow here. Medullary cavity. There's, again, little holes all in here. Now the bones, the ends are called epiphysis. If you remember, epi means on top of. So your epiphysis are on the ends that will have articular cartilage on the ends. Then the shift or change meta to the shaft here of this uh, femur, which is the largest bone, heaviest bone in your body. Oh, by the way, you break your thigh bone. You know what it takes to break that? Um, I've only had two or three patients who had um, out and out fracture of the femur. They got hit by like trucks. Um, for whatever reason, I have a lot of patients with fractures from like UPS trucks, FedEx trucks. Um, and uh, this was back then before Amazon, but I'm sure now we probably have Amazon trucks uh, hitting people now. So that's the epiphysis, metaphysis, and the whole shaft is called your diaphysis. That means if I could have a metaphyseal fracture, that'll be one here. Epiphyseal fracture, that'll be a fracture or a break here or a dia diaphyseal fracture, that'll be a straight up break right in the middle of the shaft of the bone. So you can see how in radiology or and orthopedics, which um, deals with uh, a lot of uh, bone fractures and injuries, you could see how knowing these things are very useful. And you could see also here, this is called in children, the epiphyseal line right here. This is where you grow. This is where new bone cells, also known as osteoblasts, turn into osteocytes, which is the mature bone cell. They grow right here. And then when you uh, don't grow anymore, right, it turns that epiphyseal line turns into an epiphyseal plate. And that's actually, when we look at bones in, um, uh, what do you call that, in, in pathology and in forensics, uh, which is a gruesome, gruesome thing when you have to identify the sex and the age of, uh, uh, of a cadaver or of a dead body um, by its bones. And that's one of the ways we identify age. And we could do, look at this epiphyseal line or epiphyseal plate, right? Yes, that line, they, um, it is known as the growth plate. That's where you grow. So having a metaphyseal fracture, that's a no bueno. Um, my father-in-law had one and, and it ruined, um, um, it totally ruined his, uh, his, uh, gait or his, uh, ability to walk. Now, when you look at this, okay, can you see how it's like layers and layers and layers? And that's essentially how your bone is, get, uh, is, is not only light, but it's strong. And we know it's light and it's quick because there's spaces in it. Bone isn't heavy. Bone isn't that heavy. So have you ever tried this? Try hitting yourself or someone you don't love or maybe someone you love. I don't know. I don't know what you're into, right? Uh, you take a one sheet or two sheets of, of uh, newspaper, right? If I, if I smack you with that, you'd be looking at me like, what's wrong with you, right? But if I took that newspaper, right, 
the two or three sheets of newspaper and I rolled it up really, really tight, just like here, in nice tight layers. How strong would that be? Um, uh, it, 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 it'll be, and the bone itself is already strong and it's, and it's this organization which gives the bone strength. So let's look at these words, osteocyte, osteoblast, osteoclast, okay? So let me see if I can uh, find a, a nice, Diagram. Mm -hmm. Where? Mm. Here's maybe a good one. Here, here's one. Let's look at this. Okay, so we have osteocytes which is the mature cell. We have osteoblasts, which is the immature cell. So you have an osteoblast, which is an immature cell, and it grows and grows and grows. It doesn't do much. And then we mineralize it. That means we add some minerals in it, like calcium and phosphate. And then with those mineralization, it becomes a mature osteocyte. Now, there's some, the other reason why the bone is so strong, because it does something, especially when you're younger, called remodeling. So let's say there's some damage to the mature osteocyte, or maybe I have some demineralization. I, I, I lost a, a little bit of the mineralization, and if I lose that, the bone's gonna get a little bit weak. So we have something called the osteoclast. The osteoclast then does what? breaks down this damaged osteocyte and then signals the osteoblast to replace it. And that's called remodeling. So when you're young, it goes through this cycle of breaking down, building up, breaking down, building up. That's why when you're younger, you could do things like, um, I don't know, uh, what's a foolish thing I did once? Uh, I used to snowboard when I was a kid and um, uh, I jumped off of a cliff and I fell, I think, 14, 15 feet onto pure rock. I didn't break a single thing. Um, I can tell you right now, if I fell out of my car, I think I would break something. Now, why is it? Why does 15-year-old Nelson get to walk away from um, uh, of a bad fall with nothing but a couple of bruises and a couple of sprains? But... 50 year old Nelson gets to have a trip to the hospital and maybe a cast because that remodeling of osteoblasts to mature osteocyte to osteoclast, that cycle is not as efficient as it was when you're younger. That's why when you're older, you, um, especially if you're um, uh, greater than the age of 60 or you have any arthritis problems or any bone demineralization problems, right? Um, you should really pay attention to not falling. Uh, wear sensible shoes. Um, I, I almost used to never grab the, 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 side, the you know, the, the railing uh, when, I, um, when I walk up and down the stairs. Now I always do uh, because um, when you get older, this here is not as efficient. We look here, you could see how, again, that sandwich effect that I talked about with the ultra hard compact bone on the outside and layers, and it allows the spongy bone and even the spongy bone forms like this little scaffolding here. So it makes the bone not only light, it makes the bone efficient so um, nutrients can go in and out of here and especially minerals, which is really important, okay? Now for future training, not for this class, you're gonna to need to know all these words and not only know all these words, if you took a look at a typical bone, a typical bone has little things sticking out of it like a condyle or a protuberance or a process or some, sport, some sort of like ridge or spine, tuberosity, crests. Um, you're gonna to have to be able to name all of them. Um, but right now, the only thing you'll be responsible for are the major bones that we talk about and also I'll have a, um, a diagram 
a practice diagram, uh, which you guys can practice on. So for example, if you're looking at um, your typical um, long bone, which is your femur here, you see all these little ridges and things like this. So if any of you ever want to go to medical school, you're going to have to know what all these are. Oh, by the way, if it has a sulcus or a ridge or a hole like here, this mental foramen here, um, here are these holes, fissures, there's something that goes through them. So you want to go to medical school, got to memorize all of them. Uh, that's why gross anatomy is um, a one year class with an eight hour lab per week. That's something like 46 weeks um, and with an eight hour lab and I believe it's three, three or two uh, lecture classes per week of three hours a piece, something like that. So there's much more things here than meets the eye. But for us, the only thing you need to know, and I'll put it in context, of course, in the, um, you know, in a skeleton, you need to be able to do, identify, yes, yes, this is a skull. And we're going to be also going through uh, what parts of the skull, but you don't need to know all the sulcus, sinus, crest, fossa. There's a ton of them, right? That's for future training. But it's nice because at this level, you learn all this stuff first, learning all the little holes. Eh, that's just icing on the cake. Um, but the, the cake is a, is a rather large cake. You can see here also the skull has sinuses or spaces. That's why your head, when you get sinusitis, feels like a bowling ball. When this fills up with just a little bit of fluid or pus or, or maybe congestion, right? And you get sinusitis. And the sinuses, they're also the reason why uh, when you listen to your own voice, you think it's like the best thing in the world. That's why when uh, you're taking a shower, you think uh, you have the next uh, hit album. But in reality, um, it sounds like uh, you're trying to drown uh, a bunch of cats. So osteocyte, that's what? Mature cell. Osteoblast, immature cell. Osteoclast, is the recycler. It resorbs bone and recycles it so we can have this whole process called remodeling. Okay. Here is another, here's a micropictograph of what a bone looks like. And when you look at it, it's all a bunch of layers, isn't it? It's neat. If any of you ever did yard work, used to be my former profession when I was in high school uh, and in the summers in college. Uh, that's why to this day, I will never ever touch any lawn care products. Uh, I'll let some poor other poor soul do it. I can't stand uh, um, the smell of grass and all that jazz. But if you've ever piled a bunch of sticks, it's easy to break one stick, isn't it? But what if I wrapped a whole bunch of sticks together it gets really strong. So now you can see exactly the organization, even at the microscopic level of how organized your bone is. And remember, we also once talked about DNA. Without the DNA telling me that this is exactly how it's gonna go down, uh, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a very interesting thing. So if you have like osteogenesis imperfecta, right? If you ever watch that movie with, uh, who is it in Samuel L and um, what's his name? Bruce Willis, right? His bones kept on breaking. Well, just imagine if this isn't properly formed, this will not, will be brittle. Or if there's not enough magnesium or phosphate or calcium in between here to give it more strength. You can also see how it's really neat that um, in this one like branch here, which is called an osteon or a grouping of an artery, vein, and nerve, along with these concentric uh, layers called lamellae, right? You even look at the word lamellae, it looks like a layer. M looks like a layer, L looks like a layer. To this day, that's what I see. I see that word when I see it here. You could also see if I break my bone, what's gonna happen? There's a nerve in there, it's gonna hurt. And arteries and veins, and it's, and it's gonna leak out blood, and that's no bueno. And we also know what's in the spongy bone, 
right? The red marrow and the yellow marrow. It's going to leak out red marrow. It's going to leak out yellow marrow in the form of fat. We don't want fat floating around in these blood vessels. Then you're going to get an embolus. And that's not good. Look at this. Can I easily take this? Erase these words, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Yup, I easily could. And you could see how malformations are very, very easy. For example, Paget's disease, okay? Uh, but again, we must focus on the normal because just anatomy and physiology, you'll be looking at that in um, uh, your pathology classes for you uh, future nurses. Now, remember I told you foramen or a hole and uh, the plural of foramen is foramina. So there's holes all over here, which by the way, any hole that's sticking out of here, eh, you wanna go to medical school, gotta memorize the hole and which, which exact nerve or artery gets broken because it makes sense. If I break that part, uh, this part of um, the diaphysis, I have to know uh, which nerve is gonna go, uh, affect. So you can now see that it's a living, breathing thing. And just like we discussed before, having arteries and veins is really great because it takes in uh, the nutrients and oxygen and brings out the carbon dioxide and its waste. But the problem is, let's say my patient has um, uh, bone cancer, Ewing sarcoma, it's a very nasty bone cancer. Uh, affects uh, adolescent boys, most common. Don't quote me on that. Um, let's say there's cancer here. Don't you think the cancer can go in here? And then go out and then travel and then metastasize someplace else. That's why breast cancer, ductal CA can go easily into your sternum, easily into your rib cage, and then into your lungs. Because of all of those arteries and veins. And remember, wherever there's an artery, there's a vein. Wherever there's an artery and vein, there's gotta be a nerve. Wherever there's an artery, vein, and nerve, there's also has to be lymphatic tissue. Okay, we know all of this. Bone formation and development, nah, let's not go over that. It's not important clinically to us, but this is important. Types O fracture, ouchie. This guy got hit by multiple um, UPS trucks. So we look at this one. It's closed because it doesn't break the skin. These are nice because then I don't have like an open fracture where you remember all those arteries and veins and all that immune system gets exposed to the outside. Nastiness from my skin, nastiness from the wound can go inside the bone, cause osteitis. That's not good. Transverse fracture means it's a fracture that went straight, straight across. Spiral fracture for all you NFL fans, especially, you know, Right when you uh, uh, when you uh, pivot and your foot gets stuck in the astroturf, right, and your body keeps on go going and a an alignment hits you, so you could kind of twist it and then break it that way. Comminuted nasty because it has little bits and pieces. Comminuted is a common fracture for bullet wounds. Now the bullet, the bullet is nasty enough but it is the shock wave that when the bullet travels into the body, if you've ever seen, you know, um, those shows where they shoot into ballistic gel and the stuff of that matter, uh, it is the shock wave of even a small caliber uh, bullet. Um, that's why uh, guns, no joke, a lot of, a lot of damage. Okay. And nowadays almost everything's legal. If you told me 25 years ago that uh, hydroshock hollow points, and Teflon, you could buy at your local store. I would have said the world's crazy, but guess what? 2021, we're, we're, we're shooting for ultra crazy. Impacted, that's when, uh, it's hard to show here, but that's when like the bone like, like smashes in, into this part and it kind of like, um, it smashes into each other. Like, you know, kind of like a, a train smashing into each other. Um, a better uh, example of an impacted fracture would be um, if uh, someone ju uh, jumped out of a, off a building, right, and uh, they impacted not only their femur, but uh, their vertebrae would collapse in. And that's uh, an example of an uh, impacted. And, and funny, not funny, haha, but funny odd thing is 
uh, a lot of the people uh, when I was in EMS who jumped off the building, uh, they survived. So if ever you're planning to commit suicide, uh, don't jump off a building. Try to try to pick something that's uh, that's a sure thing. Also, poison isn't a sure thing either. Just kidding, my gosh. I can I can even feel the the groaning of oh, did he just tell us how to commit suicide? No, I did not. And that's my story. I'm sticking to it, even though this thing is in recording. Is it recording? Yes, it is. Good. Green stick. Now, green stick is really neat. Well, not neat. Not if you're a kid. You're a kid, less than five years old. Uh, you know how they they say bouncing baby boy or bouncing baby girl because when you're a kid, you don't have as much mineral deposits as um, as an adult. So your bones are a little bit on the bouncy, on the loose side. So a green stick uh, fracture is more common with uh, pediatric where it breaks on one side and then the other side it like bends. Oblique just means it's going off like diagonally. Hey, doesn't this look good? It even puts the letters in for me. Do you think I could easily take this, copy and paste it and say, which of the following is an open fracture? Which of the following is a closed fracture? Which of the following is a green stick? Easy peasy for that kind of question. Um, oh, so what is another thing that bones do? Well, we already we talked about calcium, mag magnesium, and phosphate help. Those are the minerals that help make the bone strong, right? You know, milk does a body good. Well, another thing that is a very important component is vitamin D synthesis. Now, vitamin D you get from sunlight, okay? And then it gets uh, processed. And guess who gets to store it? Of course, uh, it is uh, bone tissue, right? Because one of the functions of bone is uh, minerals. So when you get older, you could get demineralization and some of these minerals get leaked out. And that's why when you get older, you start taking supplements. I'm not a fan as a chemist, I'm not a fan of supplements because I know for a fact that you load yourself with supplements, uh, they tend to end up in the urine right? But if you eat it with a good balanced uh, meal and your supplements, uh, it should work out, uh, uh, work out in your favor. Um, another thing that uh, there are that relates to nutrients and bone health is, of course, vitamin K. And vitamin K is really important, uh, not only for the mineralization of bone, it's very important for bleeding. Okay? And magnesium, fluoride, we talked about that. We, not, we didn't talk about that, but we know that fluoride, because it's a big thing for um, uh, teeth, right? Omega-3 fatty acids, okay? Now, uh, of course, there's going to be fat in there, right? And I don't know why they wrote this, may interfere with osteoblast function. Um, well, if you got way too much of it, yeah, maybe. But uh, what's more important is calcium. Vitamin D, vitamin K, magnesium, phosph uh, phosphates, right? All of these, their minerals get stored in the bone. Sounds like a beautiful all of the above question. But what happens, especially if you're female, right? Bone loss due to menopause. What's going to happen? Sorry, ladies. Osteoporosis, okay? And if we look at the word osis, abnormal condition, osteo means bone, pore is for porous, it starts leaking out minerals, okay? That's why ladies, uh, make sure to, uh, um, especially uh, those of you who are older uh, or had uh, children, um, because um, remember that uh, bone demineralization, uh, especially in your later years, is uh, something to think about. Or even if, you, even, even if you're a male patient, um, stuff happens. Remember, uh, growing old gracefully requires work, uh, requires maintenance, okay? Now, there's some, uh, of course, growth hormones, sex hormones also uh, play an important role in the skeletal system. Uh, skeletal system of the men are very different than women. So, of course, the sex hormones play a part in that. Uh, thyroxine or the, um, uh, the thyroid hormones, of course, deals with uh, metabolism, right? 
parathyroid hormone, calcitonin, and calcitriol all deal with uh, calcium and phosphate absorption and how things, uh, um, um, how the bone keeps it and releases it. And this is for, uh, I'm not going to go into uh, it now for this, cor for this course, um, but definitely uh, for further training, look into how calcitriol, parathyroid hormone, and calcitonin and all them how, uh, and I believe they go over that in your, uh, well, they should in your biochemistry class. So you can see here, osteoclast, osteoblast, right? How things grow, it's all a cycle. And you can see here, doesn't this look familiar? Doesn't this look like a seesaw, just like homeostasis? So right now, when your body goes through any hypocalcemia or hypercalcemia, um, your body will do what? will mess with calcium resorption from bone. If I need more calcium from bone, the osteoclast will do what? Break down some cells and release it, right? Or my kidneys could throw it out. Or I, um, uh, I get it through uh, diet, okay? Uh, all right, end of chapter, next chapter, next, next, next. Moving on, moving on. Oh, looky here. That's interesting. Couldn't I easily just be lazy and take all of these questions? I could, but I don't. I make my own. But, you know, there is really uh, a lot of uh, opportunity there for practice. Here is the skull. It's old school. Look, how, look at that. The shading and all that. Again, another classification system. Axial versus appendicular. Now, axial means axis, you know, like a top. So what's in your axis? Your skull, your thorax, and your vertebrae. And what's appendicular? That is your shoulder girdle, which comprises of your scapula, and it looks like a blade your humerus or your funny bone and your clavicle here, which is your collarbone. That looks like a beautiful all of the above question, doesn't it? You have your pelvic bones here, right? And then everything down to your toes. And you'll also notice that your toes are called phalanges. So your fingers are called phalanges. So on an operative report or any report, how do I know what I'm talking about? Well, if I say phalanges, lower extremity, right, then I'm talking about, you know, this foot. If I say uh, phalanges, upper extremity, right, I'm talking about these fingers. And starting from the thumb on down, I have to call it digit one, two, three, four, five. And starting from the big toe, digit one, two, three, four, five. So, for example, if I have a fracture, distal, uh, uh, distal phalange, lower extremity, right. So it's got to be what? My tip of my big toe, right here. Your tarsals and metatarsals, right? This is the metatarsals are the dorsum of your foot. Your tarsals are those cuboidal or uh, cube-like bones of your ankle. Of course, your patella. You have your tibia and your fibula, also known as your tib-fib. We, we always say tib-fib together because uh, if you fracture your tibia, the bigger one that's in the front, nine times out of 10, your fibula will also be fractured too. Radius and ulna. The way you tell your radius and ulna apart, your radius is thumb side, your ulna is pinky side. So these in light green, those are your appendicular uh, bones. And here in this like brownish desert tan, light tan gray, that will be your ac uh, axial skeleton. Could I just easily take this, wipe all this out, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and ask you, one, is it axial or is it appendicular? I could do that. All right, hint, hint. Okay, this is your calvarium. 
also known as your brain case, right? It is a flat bone. Here are your facial bones. And look at this. This is a lot, isn't it? Well, I'm just going to only ask the big bones, the really basic, basic. But eventually, you know, might as well memorize all these little holes now, right? But what do you need to know? Your jaw, mandible. The upper part of your, uh, um, uh, your teeth and your jaw is your uh, maxilla. Your um, nasal bone, of course, for your nose. Your cheekbone right here, that's your zygomatic or zygomaticus, depending what bone we're talking about. And of course, right here in the front of your noggin is of course your frontal bone. I won't ask you specifically uh, what, um, uh, what these holes are. Like, I won't ask you, is this the mental foramen? Is this the mental foramen? Is this the supraorbital foramen? No, I'll just point at it and I go, this hole right there. And you'll tell me, foramen, okay? Now, you also have your nasal septum, right? Right in here. And you have uh, this part of your back of your eyeball. That's your sphenoid bone, right? And then on the inside part here, near your lacrimal, is your ethmoid. And that's the worst I'll do to you. Oh, uh, well, there's a better view for these bones. I'm going to show you in a second. So, of course, frontal, right? This green thing here, right? That's, of course, your uh, zygomatic, right? Your cheekbone. Okay, you also have, uh, I could also ask this, this is your mandible, this is your maxilla, this is your frontal, of course. You need to know this, this is your coronal suture. This is where your crown will sit, right, on your head. Your coronal suture separates your frontal bone from your paired parietal bones. And you have your lambd lambdoid, lambda, lambdoid suture right here. And sutures are, where uh, bones meet, where it got fused. And we're gonna talk about that kind of joint space uh, where the bones don't move. And that is a suture. And then you have here the back part known as your occiput or your occipital bone. And then this purple thing here, that's your temporal bone. And where this, all these three things uh, join, uh, they call it the terion, uh, also known as your bregma. You might see it in other uh, textbooks, uh, the word bregma. This is the reason why when you hit somebody in the face, don't hit them here, don't hit them here, don't hit them here. This is very strong, okay? Hit them here. Did I just say that? That's awful of me. I'm awful. You see the brain, but actually don't hit them in the head and the skull's pretty freaking strong. You can see here, there are fossa inside the uh, uh, brain, the calvarium, which house certain sections of the brain, the posterior, middle, it does the posterior, middle, and anterior portions of the brain, and it sits right in there. And there's cerebrospinal fluid that floats the brain in here. So you not only have the skull or calvarium protecting your brain, you got a, like a layer of water, so your brain's floating around in there. So if you get hit by like, I don't know, a bat or something, right? Your brain will just slosh around in there. It'll still get damaged, but not as much as it would if the brain was sitting right up against this thing here. Such violent thoughts, geez, where'd I get these? Awful, okay? Look at here, they're looking at the temporal bone and specifically, so the temporal bone, right, should be on the side, that's your temporal. Then you got your frontal and you got your parietal here and then very, very back, your occiput. Of course, this is your mandible, your maxilla, and of course your orbits. But right here, what's really important about the temporal, right? You have uh, these things that are sticking out. This is your mastoid process or mastoid bone. And um, what's really important is this is your external acoustic meatus. Meatus means uh, opening. And this is to your ear, to your uh, inner ear. So you could see if you have a temporal fracture, you're also gonna have some uh, hearing stuff. Okay, that's interesting to look at. Here's the bottom part. The really important part are uh, right here. 
That is the foramen magnum. Magnum meaning, you know, big foramen hole. And the important part of the foramen magnum is that's where your uh, spinal cord and your vertebrae go through. Very important right there. And that's the base of your skull. And you can see here, you have your palatine process, which is uh, your upper palate or your hard palate. You know, that's the thing when, uh, when you eat, your tongue is gonna smash up against this. This is a continuation of uh, that bone that's inside uh, your nose that separates the left from the right. This is called your vomer. But you can see here, for future training, you gotta memorize all these holes and what's inside them. And what happens if there, goes, if there was a fracture? What happens if there was damage? And you can see here, this is a flat bone. It's just molded, okay? And of course, here, there's ethmoid. Here, there's sphenoid. But these views, eh, nice to know. This view, this view, must know. These are nice, these are for your future neuroanatomy. Here's the back, and now you can see why they call it lambda. It looks like a triangle. And in Greek letters, the triangle is, uh, is called lambda. And this is, your lam uh, uh, this is your lambdoid suture, and this is your occipital bone. Very, very important, your occipital bone, because all your really important things, like vision and breathing, is in the uh, posterior portion of your brain and deep. So getting hit in that back part of the head is no bueno. Here's an internal view, nice to know. Eh, I like the other views uh, for, for an exam better. Okay, so you can see how this is lovely free textbook has, uh, um, has a lot of neat things in it, just like any other textbook. Your orbit, okay, which is, uh, that's where your eyeball goes. And of course, there's of course an optic canal that's going to have a optic nerve in it. Makes sense, right? Here thing I wanted to look at is this thing right here, which is, uh, um, uh, well, this is your hard palate. The thing I wanted to show you here, you see how close your brain is right up here? And this thing right here is called your cribriform plate. We'll be talking about this when we talk about the sense of smell. So if you want to like some snort some cocaine or heroin, you could see how there's nerve endings right here and easily goes right up into your brain, right? Not a good thing. And then it eats away at this, erodes this, and erodes all this other tissue here. And that's why they have nosebleeds. And they're always sniffing a lot. Sinuses we already talked about, right? And we all don't feel our sinuses until when? Uh, until you get sinusitis and your head feels like a bowling ball. And then you start talking like this, start talking funny. The curvature of the spine. There are four types of vertebrae. You have your cervical, and there's seven of them, right? I always remember seven because you're lucky you don't, uh, you don't break your neck. Uh, you, your C1 and C2, uh, that's called your atlas and your axis. Um, the C1 vertebrae helps your, um, maybe we'll show it in a minute, helps, your, helps you uh, move your head up and down and that's called your atlas, and your axis, C2 vertebrae, helps you move your head from left to right. You have your thoracic vertebrae, and you can see there's a thoracic curve here, right? Because you also have a curvature here of your thoracic cage or your rib cage. And of course, you got 12 ribs, right? You gotta have uh, 12 thoracic vertebrae. You have five lumbar or your loin right here in your uh, uh, waist area. Right? If you're wearing a loincloth, and this is your lumbar vertebrae, and you see how heavy they are to support the majority of the weight. Right? You can see how small and thin the cervical vertebrae compared to these vertebrae down here. And then you have your fused sacrum, which is like five to six different bones. And when you're a baby, well, not baby, maybe, I don't know. Yeah, maybe a baby. They get all fused. And then your very, very tip is called your coccyx. And you could see here, you have your sacro, your sacrum here, and your coccyx, 
right? Your tailbone right here forms a nice little curve. And that curve for female patients is exaggerated. So because if baby's in there, they're like, wee, and they could go out. Okay, so know the different kinds. So if I point at the, I could take all this and I point at the top, at the neck, you're gonna say cervical. I could ask you, how many cervical? You're lucky to have seven. How many ribs you got? 12, therefore 12 thoracic. Lumbar, five. And one big one, and that's your sacrum, ending in the little uh, bone right here, which is your coccyx. Um, so those are the regions, those are the curvatures, but you could see how things can go wrong. So if you have a lateral curvature of your spine, that's called scoliosis, that's no bueno. If you have a, a, a what do you call that, humpback, that's called kyphosis, and lordosis is swayback, and uh, all of these things are no good, and uh, we either do surgery or um, these braces to put you back in line. This is your typical vertebrae, and again, irregular bone. And what's inside? You have your spinal cord. And what's coming out of the sides? You have your spinal nerves. So it's very, very important that these things are aligned right, and they're not slipping out, especially this thing right here, which is your, it goes, um, uh, it says annulus fibrosis, but this is your intervertebral disc. All your spinal cord has these um, uh, cartilage that are in between. Now, if the, all the cartilage is all nice and neat, it's wonderful. But when you have a slip disc or a slipped disc, this thing will push out. Guess what it's going to start impinging on? It's going to start pressing on these spinal nerves. And one of two things are going to happen. You're either going to have a shooting lightning pain from your back to your toes, or you'll start having numb. You start having uh, like feelings of being numb. And either way, that is not a good thing. So that's where you could see how this annulus fibrosis nucleus propulsus here can, um, can herniate or stick out the wrong way. And that's called a slipped disc. And sometimes if you have pain states, another thing that we also do is you see some of these archways and some of these spinous processes, we cut them out so that it frees up the nerve here. That's pretty. And remember the atlas and axis? It, this is how you remember atlas. Atlas is C1. You see how it has these things here and it like holds up your skull? So your skull will be moving front to back, front to back. So C1 is when how you're capable of nodding your head yes. C2 is axis, means it's spinning around like a top. So you should be able to say yes or no with C2. And remember, look how small they are and how delicate they are and how light they are. And it makes sense because your neck has to be, you know, quick and mobile. You could see the thoracic vertebrae, they have these little uh, pedicles here or tuberosities. And that's to, that, um, uh, that's to fit, hello, welcome. Uh, that's to fit, um, what do you call that? Your uh, rib cage. Lumbar, you see how the body of the vertebrae is very, very thick, very, very heavy. That makes sense. And last but not least, you have all this fora foramina right here in the level of your sacrum to supply all your sacral nerves from S1 through S4. They fit through all through these little holes and they're very, very important for all your organ systems here in the netherworld, especially for urination. And you can see here, this is an example of a nucleus propulsus, also known as a slipped disc or nucleus propulsus herniation. You can see how it's impinging on the spinal nerve and it either can cause pain or uh, weakness or both. Either way, it's not good. Either way, if you know anybody with slipped disc, it's not fun. Here you go. Here's the different kinds of, of, of um, ribs. Let's see, there's 12 of them, of course. Are they gonna talk about the ribs? Here's your sternum. This is the corpus or body, and it has cartilage on the very, very end. That's the xiphoid process. 
that's the place where your landmark for CPR, and then you have your manubrium. I always look at this like a um, like a tie, a necktie, and then the manubrium, right? That's a man's tie, so that goes here, and the body, which is the corpus, right? Um, do, 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 do. Are they going to go over the different kinds of ribs? Yes, here you go. Here's the different kinds of ribs that you need to know. I could have this and then uh, I could break one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I could point to a rib and I could tell you which one are what they call the true ribs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You could see ribs one through seven, they connect directly into the, uh, the sternum, your chest plate here, your breastbone. And that's called a true rib, right? So ribs eight through 12 are called false ribs. So if I point at eight, you'll tell me false. Nine, 10, 11, 12, false. And the 11 and 12 are called floating because they don't connect to anything in the front. So again, as a summary, one through seven, true ribs. Eight through 12, false ribs. 11 and 12 are also uh, floating ribs. 11 and 12 looks like a beautiful both A and B question, hint, hint. I'm giving way too many hints. I feel, I feel like giving way too many hints. Soft spots. Those of you who have children, you know about soft spots. These are the, these are the, the spots where you poke your kid in the head. No, it is not. This is the parts where when the developing of the newborn, that the, the bones aren't uh, fully formed yet. But as they grow, these uh, soft spots known as fontanelles, and you have an anterior one and a posterior one, will start to close. And that's one of the milestones of what we look at if uh, the baby has good development. We also look at the head circumference as well, okay? So I could point at a baby skull or a newborn skull, and I go, hey, what are these soft spots? And you'll tell me, those are fontanelles. And then when the bone grows, it fuses, and then you'll have sutures. Okay. We already talked about that. More lovely questions that you could practice on. We already went through this, clavicle. I think a lot of this is wash, rinse, and repeat. And you can see how, like, I just want you to know that this is your clavicle. But you can see they have your glenoid cavity, glenoid uh, tuberosity, your acromion, suprascapular notch, coracoid process. What is the function of the coracoid? You can see how complicated medical school can get. Oh, by the way, you're thinking of uh, doing DNP as well. You get to uh, do the same anatomy and physiology that doctors get to do. And that is this, this is closer to uh, that level. But for right now, the only thing I need for you to know is that's a clavicle, right? Or, or this, that's a clavicle. And this is a scapula. Your clavicle is your uh, collarbone and your scapula, that's your, you know, um, uh, your backbone and your clavicle and your scapula along with your humerus right here they are part of your pectoral girdle. And why do they call it a girdle? Because it wraps around that area. Same thing with your pelvic girdle. And we went through all of these on, on the bigger. You have distal, middle, and proximal. Those are your phalanges, right? You don't need to memorize all the little bones. Just know that these are your carpals. And also know how to label. Thumb is one, two, three, four, and five, right? upper extremity, therefore they are fingers. Here's your classic carpal tunnel. When uh, this, um, this ligament right here, your uh, flexor tenaculum, when that breaks, it collapses into here and then it impinges on the nerve. I am going through that right now. Uh, it's no fun. Hope I don't need surgery. I hate surgery. You guys know that, how much I hate surgeons and surgery. Here is your, I love saying that, every chance I get. 
Here's your pelvic girdle. Of course, we already know your sacrum, and at the very end is your uh, coccyx, right? So what do you need you uh, what do you need to uh, to know that this is part of your appendicular skeletal system. This, your hips right here. You have a piece of cartilage right here, which sometimes separates, especially for the larger pregnancies. That's your pubic symphysis. And this is made out of cartilage. And this is also a major landmark, especially when we're doing um, fundic height and uh, measurements for mommy in the wonderful world of obstetrics. Um, so, do, 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 do. what else do you need to know about that? The worst thing I could ask you are the major bones. So if we're looking at the top part of your hip, that's your ilium. And if we're looking at the bottom part, that's your ischium. And uh, maybe I might ask about this big hole here, and that's your obturator foramen, where your obturator muscle goes through. Okay, that's the worst I'll do to you. But I could ask you, what bone is this part of? This is part of your hip bone. And what, uh, uh, what is it also part of? It is part of your pelvic girdle, which is part and parcel of your articular skeletal system. Okay, and also this uh, ridge here is also a wonderful landmark in um, 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 uh, clinical practice. Uh, for a whole bunch of things, especially injections. Now you look at here, what's the difference between a male and female? Well, the female, do you see it's like a bowl, right? And if we looked at it from another angle, uh, this sacrum is much more curved because you could see baby's got to fit into there. And uh, if you look at the male, it's a little bit more what? It's a little bit more straight. This, you could see, you can even imagine baby sitting in there. Me, I don't like to imagine those things because I got way too many kids in my life. I hope none of you are in that category. And if you are, thoughts and prayers, everybody. All right. Let's look at this. Uh, the, again, the worst I'm going to ask you, femur, right? Uh, patella. Ischium, ilium, obturator, foramen, um, uh, sacral bones, fused. I'm not going to go into greater detail, but you could see how easily you can go into greater detail. Ooh, let's look at the feats. Tarsals, of course. All of this here is uh, these uh, cube-like, dice-like um, uh, bones here, which are part of your ankle metatarsals, which is part of the dorsum of your foot, and your phalanges. And they're labeled one, two, three, four, five. And your big toe is one. And of course, you have a distal, proximal, and then it goes into, uh, and you have a distal, middle, and uh, proximal for your pinky and for your other toes. Now, look at here on the end. That's your heel. That's your calcaneus, right? Heel bone. Look how strong that thing is. And it makes sense because I have to walk. Oh, big toe. Hallux. Uh, um, for uh, thumb, it's called uh, polysis, P-O-L-L-I-C-I-S. But nice to know. What's better? Digit one, two, three, four, five, distal, middle, and proximal. Uh, lower extremity. That's either right or left. Be able to be able to tell your right from your left. Limb growth not so important. Ossification of articular bones not important. Oh, club foot. Never saw a club foot. Only saw it in medical school. Never saw it in real life. Ooh, time flies when you're having so much fun. It's now 7.04, so let's get this show on the low road. I don't want to talk about development. This is not a developmental class. We're a clinical class. We want to know what do we need to help our patient clinically. 
Well, let's talk about now joints. Now, what are joints? Joints are any spaces between two bones, and there's a classification of joints. And the first classification is immobile or nearly immobile. They shouldn't move at all. Sin means sane. So synarthrosis, an example is your sutures. So you need to know your coronal suture. You need to know your lambdoid suture. Heck, look at this. Here's your squamous suture, which separates your parietal from your um, uh, temporal, and you have your terion right here. Now, and those are sutures. Those are examples of synarthrotic joints. Amphiarthrotic, amphi, amphibious, right? My lovely Marine Corps is amphibious. They're both land and water operations, special operations capable, by the way. Amphi means both. So they kind of move. So your intervertebral disc needs to move a little. Um, the inter, uh, um, uh, intercostal cartilage in between your ribs need to move a little, not a lot, but just enough to move around. So your intercostal cartilage in between your ribs have to move a little bit so you can breathe. Your intervertebral discs have to move a little bit so you can, you know, I don't know, do the twist or do Zumba, you know, whatever floats your boat. But the diarthrotic, dia means complete or thorough. That is fully movable joints, okay? Like your hip joint here, also known as your acetabulum. Now, diarthrotic, also known as a synovial joint, is freely movable. Okay, so let, let's jump right into uh, uh, synarthrotic joint, right? This is fully movable, okay? And we have articular cartilage. Now, what makes um, synovial joints special is they have to have smooth movement. And um, you have your articular joints to decrease um, the friction in between these two. And you have uh, this little pocket here called a bursa. Right? This bursa has synovial fluid in it, so uh, which helps um, uh, decrease friction and helps move the joint along. But when you get older, start to become a boomer, you get stuff in here, and then you get inflammation or infection. Inflammation or infection of the joint space is called arthritis. And uh, the Department of Rheumatology, there are dozens and dozens of different kinds of arthritis and subcategories of arthritis, so they are the experts. So synovial, synarthrotic joint, fully movable, uh, movable, fully movable, and it has synovial fluid, which is really important for that, uh, that movement, okay? okay? And you see here how kind of complicated it, uh, things here. And we also have ligaments. For those of you football and basketball fans, you have your PCL and your ACL, your anterior cruciate ligament, and cruz, cruz means to cross, right? So they cross each other. So you have a posterior one and anterior one. Mine's totally train wreck and it leaks synovial fluid everywhere. They've been telling me since I was 30 that I need uh, surgery, but I keep on ignoring them. We'll see how long I walk. Patella, knee joint, you need to know, right? And, uh, oh, bursitis. So if I have inflammation or infection of that pocketing uh, with the joint, that's a problem, right? Here's the different kinds of joints. Maybe you, uh, uh, these are all synovial. I don't need to memorize them, but you can see anywhere there's movement, that's a synovial joint. And they're, and they're made you know, to move certain ways. That's why I love MMA and fight science. Um, it, it's really great that uh, all the stuff that I learned when, when I was a kid and when I was in the military now makes total sense to me now that uh, I am a semi-expert in anatomy and physiology. Last but not least, let's look at the motions because this is clinically relevant and important. Flexion is the ability to decrease the angle of a joint. Extension is the exact opposite, okay? Flexion of your head is your forward motion. Extension or hyperextension of your head is the backward motion. Okay. Uh, circumduction is round and round we go. 
adduction is moving towards midline. Like, so if I put my arm up here and move towards midline, that's adduction. If I move my arm away or abduct it, you know, what do you do when you're in an abduction? You move your arm or your leg away from midline and that's called abduction. So abduction and adduction are opposites. Flexion and extension are opposites. Flexion is decrease the angle of the joint. Extension is increase the angle of the joint. And of course, rotation, either lateral, which is to the side of your patient, or medial towards the, um, uh, towards the middle. You have pronation and supination. Pronation, the best way to, to, uh, to say it is putting my palm down on the desk. That's pronation. And supination is the exact opposite. You have dorsiflexion, which goes up. Plantar flexion, because this is the dorsum of your foot. Plantar flexion goes down. Now, um, this is how I remember it. What do you do with plants? You plant them into the ground. What do you do in plantar flexion? You're planting your toes into the ground. And of course, you, uh, for those of you ladies who love your four inch heels at the club, you could have an inversion injury when your uh, foot goes inward, you know, maybe you had a couple of, couple of too many mimosas and then, you know, your ankle went boop this way. Maybe get a little sprain or an eversion injury when your ankle splays out laterally that away. Okay. So think inversion, medial, eversion, lateral. Okay. So these are some nice things. All right, with that being said, thank you for hanging on. I am going to 